All right, we're going to get started. We're running a little short on time, I think, so I'll try and speed it up. I've only got about 30 slides, so I'm guessing 30, 40 minutes. We'll see. I have some questions at the end. So I'm Ben. I work at Douala. I'm also on the board at SEC DSM. Um, pretty happy to be here. Sorry about the weather. It kind of stinks, but I guess it's good we're inside. So I'm going to talk about some properties of immutable architecture. You probably heard the term immutable infrastructure. I want to take it up a notch and say, well, how can this be an architectural design pattern? because it changes how we do security. So I want to talk about some unique elements and properties that make us better as defenders. And automation is a key to that. So we'll go through some background today, properties of mutable architecture, uh, some examples, old and new, uh, and maybe an application of how this could work. Um, so I put Bruce Hornsby up there. My wife loves 80s music, but he's got a song um, where he says some things will never change. We're going to talk about immutability today. Um, and so when he has that thing, some things will never change, like that's my little theme song for today. Uh, because if things can't change or shouldn't change, if they do, that's rogue. So that's kind of the theme what we're doing here. She likes Mandolin Rain, too. She likes that song, Bunch of Bruce Hornsby. All right, so we're going to talk about cattle versus pets. Anyone heard that analogy before? If not, we'll talk about it. Um, talk about the term Phoenix server, Snowflake server, mutability, security properties, and examples. So first of all, cattle versus pets. Um, I'm originally from northern Wisconsin, so lots of cattle, in fact, lots of dairy cows. So up on the right are dairy cows, and that's a picture from the University of Wisconsin. That's cattle. Anyone know what type of cow that is? Probably hard to see, but it's black and white. Yes, yes, which originally is from the Schleswig-Holstein area of northern Germany, um, which my family's from, so it's kind of interesting. Um, all right, so that's Holstein cows up there. Anyone know what's down there on the lower right? My daughter, and then what's the other thing? It's my dog. His name's Hank. Some of my colleagues who came here have met him. But he's a big Great Dane, and he's a pet. We treat cattle and pets very differently. Cattle are there to serve a purpose. Holstein, Holstein cows have a very high rate of producing milk. They serve a purpose, and then when they're gone, we replace them. They're not pets. Whereas that little girl is attached to that pet like you wouldn't believe they've grown up together. So his vet bills are huge. He eats table scraps. We treat him like a pet. We're going to talk about how this really pertains to servers and infrastructure shortly. His name's Hank, by the way. All right, so what is a Phoenix server? So Phoenix server um, is kind of hard to define. So Martin Fowler is the gentleman who coined this term. He's a British uh, architect and software developer. And so I thought that was a cool icon of a Phoenix, but let's talk about what it is. And I think his definition is a really good one. Um, it should rise regularly from the ashes. Um, the advantage is you avoid configuration drift, and as you work at scale, configurations do drift. Um, ad hoc changes to configurations go unrecorded. Stuff happens. Um, so a Phoenix server is one that can rise from the ashes. Treat this thing like cattle. You can knock it over and bring it back. Um, a root of trust. Anyone heard of that term, root of trust? You go back to an area where trust is no longer derived, like a certificate authority. Well, if you trust some base image, some base part of your infrastructure, that's a root of trust. You're going back to that, which is a very good thing. Uh, so I talked about knocked over like cattle. And how do we do this? So Eric was talking about the cloud, AWS, virtualization containers. We're going to touch on that too. Using virtualization tech, this can be done via code and APIs, and a little load balancing in there to make sure it's done almost seamlessly. You can do this stuff live. Um, and then the Phoenix server was actually coined by one of Martin Fowler's colleagues. Uh, Cornelius Seitzma. What is a snowflake server? Anyone heard this one? Snowflake server? Okay. It's the opposite. This thing is kind of like my pet Hank. You treat him very carefully. And again, to good, get a good definition was tough. I think Fowler's is the best one. So it's finicky business, keep a production server running. You have to ensure the operating system and other components are properly patched, keep it up to date, upgraded regularly, configuration drift, etc. So how do you do that? It's a form of command line invocations, jumping between GUIs and editing text files. When you're done, your uniformity starts to drift. You have a snowflake server, good for a ski resort, bad for a data center. The reason it's bad, it is hard to change these things after they're running over time. Anyone have a server you're afraid to touch? It's not fun to touch? That's a snowflake. And we have to have them. Like People have snowflake servers, but it's fun to talk to them in this way because Maybe there's another way in the future you could do it slightly differently. 
on. It's hard to reproduce things when you work on these things because if they have drift or they're different, they're hard to make sure things are consistent. All right, so what is immutability? And I promise we're going to get out of the definition kind of boring part in a second here. Property being unable to be changed. And so if you go back to development languages, Java in particular is the one I think is good for today. Um, an object is considered immutable if its state cannot change after it's constructed. And why is that a good thing? It creates simple, reliable code. So that applies to infrastructure as code, and that's why I'm thinking part of this immutable architecture um, discussion matters. If something can't change, it can resist corruption. So you heard Eric talk about corruption. Tom corrupted a container instance that was running WordPress. Can we stop corruption or, or, corruption or detect it? Um, and you can also have it easier to enforce uh, validation or policy against that. Um, and by the way, I'm kind of conflating immutability, uh, containerization, and immutable infrastructure, but that's why I'm calling it immutable architecture. I think each of these pieces play into what we can do in the future. So a little more immutability. Can you apply this to more than objects, types, and sequences inside of a language? Like a tuple in Python is immutable. That's great, Ben. How does this apply to infrastructure? So one example is Docker containers, and you heard Eric touch on that a little bit. They're small, purpose-built containers that are fungible and replaceable. I like the word fungible. I wanted to use it. Um, uh, when I was taught that one in high school, good examples like corn. You harvest a whole bunch of corn, you all together put it in a silo, and then you pull your corn out because it's a fungible thing. It doesn't matter if it's mixed. Well, these are fungible and replaceable. You can do it with instances, too. It's not just containers. Uh, so virtual machines, right? If they're purpose-built, they can be launched, stopped, or destroyed and replaced. Um, yeah, sure, these things are going to change a little bit. The PIDs are going to change. The logs are going to change. But that root of trust is still established when you do these things at scale. So immutability can also be a practice, not necessarily a distinct property. I think it's both. Um, and an infrastructure. So you can do software-defined networking now. So load balancers, routes, firewalls, they can all be code-driven. And you can do this without manual intervention. If you have an automation tool that can push those changes out, you're using Git, you're doing commits, you have version history, reviews on that, et cetera, you can do immutability and infrastructure. And then you can also kill and replace parts of your infrastructure programmatically. All right, so how do you enable this stuff? How do you enable immutable architecture, I'll call it? There has to be code. Um, most cases, it's Python, just what we've been doing. Um, but you have to have code. Rooted trust, I touched on that already. You have to have a safe place to go back to. You need ruthless automation. We're going to talk a lot more about that. That means getting humans out of the equation, and quite frankly, turning everything into a damn honeypot. Um, and then monitoring. You have to monitor this stuff. So verification and integrity becomes easier. Um, interactive use and change becomes rogue. And the age of things in your environment also becomes an interesting indicator. We'll talk about that in a second. Anyone heard of the pink sombrero? There's an old post from 2011 called Cowboy Coding and the Pink Sombrero. So I work with a really good engineering team. Uh, we're hiring, by the way. Talk to me about that later um, in many positions. But they're the one that introduced me to the pink sombrero. And this means inevitably you have to go into production occasionally or you have to go someplace and unfortunately break immutability but fix something. Well, if you do that, that's a big deal. We should avoid this at all costs. So you have to do that. You put on the pink sombrero, and some people actually do this, and that means you are doing something that is dangerous, something that is an anti-pattern. You better be very careful. So when you're making changes and you're not following ruthless automation because you have an issue, think of the pink sombrero as a metaphor. Um, in the ref references at the end, I link to that um, post, but it's from 2011. And it talks about scaling an infrastructure. So think of the pink sombrero, meaning you're breaking this immutable property. So some more properties that enable it. Integrity, root of trust established can be cryptographically signed. Um, if you're on Amazon, you can cryptographically sign and attest to things because they have a PKI available to you. If you have rapid authorized change via code, it's repeatable. That's ruthless automation, and that is lower risk because you can move faster. You know what you did, you can roll back. And you can do rapid vulnerability management. If you're rolling new instances, typically in a cloud environment, those instances should come up fully patched. That's pretty nice. Uh, we'll talk more about that. But you can also patch any time of supporting architecture, meaning if you have a bunch of stateless stuff, you have a load balancer in front of it. We're going to show a, a diagram later. You should be able to roll things in production in real time to keep your environment evergreen. And then rapid recovery. Containers and, uh, and other parts of the uh, infrastructure would do this, but you have the ability to rapidly recover from an event. 
you're not going to rack, stack, power, configure, and care and feed a server. You can recover more quickly. All right, so flux is an interesting property. Flux meaning change. So an adversary who will break into an environment needs persistence. Um, they might do a smash and grab like Tom did with your tables, but if they're after data as an asset, they might hover for a while. Most advanced adversaries will have persistence over time. So this is an old stat from Netflix, but the average age of an instance in their infrastructure in 2013 was 24 days. And I'm sure it's a lot lower now. I don't have a newer stat for you, but I think that's a fascinating statistic that in their infrastructure, granted they're cloud native, that's, that's really impressive. And if they're in AWS, their machines auto patch. That means their machines, their patch cycle is less than 24 days at worst. So that's pretty cool. Um, so you've heard of NIST change some of the password requirements, right? Like how often you change it, length, do it on an event, do it based on risk. But we have these 90, 120, 180 day things in our minds when we change our credentials. Well, instance age is the new password age. I think that's interesting because if you can lower the instance age, I think you get some benefit in flux because an adversary can't hang around. You're going to kick them out just by rolling your infrastructure. Um, that's a real metric. Cloud conformity has that as a metric they offer inside of their kind of management platform. So that's kind of neat. I think anything can be a honeypot. If this stuff's ruthlessly automated and you sprinkle a little two-factor on top, you're doing pretty well. But if there are changes that are made with a pink sombrero on, you better know about it. You have alarms that go off and you watch them. Anything else that happens is rogue. And that is something that means you can detect pretty quickly. And I think you reduce your attack surface. In this case, I'm talking about containers. So Alpine Linux is super minimal as a base for your containers. The attack surface is very much restricted. You layer just what you need on top, and that container is presented. You don't have Bluetooth. You don't have a GUI. You don't have cups for printing. You don't have blah, 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 blah. So. Let's use an example. Let's do some artisanal infrastructure work. Um, so let's just use Splunk in a small environment. Let's show how you can do it manually and how you can automate this thing using some properties of immutability. I think that's a good way to bring this home. So if you're going to do a Splunk deployment, and I've done one a long time ago, and it was artisanal, about 10 years ago, actually, well, what do you need? Well, you've got to get storage. So you talk to the storage people to get you know, access to the SAN or whatever else. Um, you need instances of physical servers based on your org. I had physical servers back then. I had to rack, stack, power, et cetera. You need licenses. You need digital certificates. So you got to talk to the certificate person or team. You need agents to be deployed all over the place to collect the Splunk logs and ship them back. Um, and you probably have to tie it to LDAP for authentication. That seemed pretty reasonable for a Splunk rollout. And your server and storage are probably tightly coupled. Back in the day, and I'm not doing this stuff that much anymore, Typically, you wanted really good disk presented to you via expensive SAN that was just for you or really expensive RAID on there. So they're pretty tightly coupled. All right, so what do you do next? You need a pretty performant host. So back then, it was Red Hat was pretty much the standard. Two CPUs, eight gigs of RAM, two terabytes of disk, and hopefully you don't rack, stack, and power this stuff. So now you have your, your server, right? You have to get SSH access or console access. If you're in VMware, you're in that VMware vSphere manager thingy. Um, you got to get sudo access because you can't install this as a regular user. You got to install the Splunk RPMs, enable the boot start, and then you got to install the licenses after that's done. Change your defaults. And you're probably following a checklist, right? Doing this via a checklist. Maybe you have Puppet or Chef or something doing it for you, but you're probably following a checklist. I was back in the day. Bind to an IP, secure stuff, deploy your agents, and then you can do dashboard and query time. So that's a lot of different steps. So graphically, this is my best representation of what I think this could look like back in the day. So if it's a manual process, it's gray. If it's partially automated orange, if it's fully automated green. Well, I think your provisioning is probably somewhat automated, probably giving a big VM. Console access and software is probably manual, because not everyone has access to the licenses, probably restricted. Um, install your software, that's partially automated. Um, the Splunk installer is kind of nice. Config changes deploy agents. So I think there's some opportunities there. So the automation really in the orange is provisioning your VM, the install script from Splunk, and agents via an orchestration tool. All right, so what are some opportunities then? I think your uniformity as a function of scale is, is going to drift. Um, if you're building a big Splunk environment, and I haven't done this in a while, but you had a bunch of these servers. So 
you can have a lot of checklists and a lot of good process and a lot of QA, but the chance you'll miss something is very real. Um, do you allow system changes? These are all mutable servers. You can SSH into them, you can change them. So these are open for change. Um, authentication is obviously allowed, and do they have MFA enabled? Like, do you have Duo and something snapped into PAM so that when you do authenticate, at least it's really well protected? Probably not. Um, speed to implement and update as a, function of human, as a function of human resources, or people. Meaning, if you want to speed this project up, you need more people to do it. Because right now we're not automating this. Um, you're going to have configuration drift over time. You're going to have patch windows, you're going to have downtime. The configuration drift over time is going to happen. All right, so that's the artisanal role. How can we do this a little more automated? I've got some charts coming. I know I'm a little devoid of graphics here. We'll, we'll add some in. All right, so we're going to use immutable architecture principles. If we do this, we're going to have storage that's not as tightly coupled. We can use elastic block storage. Uh, we can use an M4 instance. Those are pretty easy to get access to. That'll fit that same performance that we talked about earlier. You can apply license as code, certificates as code. Um, agents can be applied via Chef. And you can apply LDAP integration all via code. So you have a looser coupling of server and storage, which is nice. All right, so what can this look like? Well, if I'm going to provision this instance, it's a custom AMI. It's an Amazon machine image. And it's got stuff baked into it. That saves you a ton of time, and you have root of trust. All right, I don't need console access to deploy this. I don't need software to deploy it because I have it baked in. I just have to mount the elastic block storage, install the software, which is automated, apply the config change, which is automated, and deploy the agents, which are automated. So we've shortened a lot of time. We've done some pretty cool stuff here. So what's different? Speed, this can be done in under 10 minutes. Um, and if you do it once under 10 minutes, you can do an upgrade in under 10 minutes. So that's pretty cool. Uh, rollback, if something's messed up, you're not getting a restoration out and restoring something. You can roll back quickly. No SSH required to do this, at least on this infrastructure. You can roll it out. So it makes monitoring for authentication events all the more meaningful. I'm not saying it's a honeypot, but if you don't have to SSH in, that means if someone is, they have a pink sombrero on or it's rogue. It's that simple. Okay. Uh, no good state. We talked about that. You can have remote attestation with Amazon. Uh, file integrity monitor. You can tune this stuff because you know what should change and what shouldn't change. So that's kind of a nice property because file integrity monitoring is not necessarily easy. Uh, I talked about a honeypot because this thing should never change like the Bruce Hornsby song. And if you sprinkle in some MFA and behavioral monitoring with off-host log analysis, you have a party, meaning things are going really well. So can we do better than this? We took a Splunk rollout, which is pretty manual. Now we automated it and made it cool. Can we do better? And the answer is we can do, we can do better. There's more we can do here. So let's take it to the next level with load balancing, Docker containers, and orchestration tool like either ECS or Kubernetes. Um, anyone? So you heard about containers from Eric. I have to cover those. Are you guys cool with what containers are? Nice. Docker file. Okay, we're good. All right, so these things are optimized for containerized applications. Um, so good examples. These are like, I think, the top 10 or 12 I found. Node, Nginx. Java apps, Postgres, et cetera. Was your WordPress in the containers? WordPress is raw, but there's no app in containers. Got it. Cool. All right. Stateless applications are really nice for this because you can knock these containers over. You load balance them. Your end user doesn't know the difference. You have a minimal attack service via Alpine Linux or CoreOS. So um, do you talk about the term living on the land at all? Okay, so if you're an adversary and you break into something, you're probably going to want to live off the land. Use the tools available to you. So in a Windows environment, you're going to use PowerShell. It's there, right? Well, I pop a shell in WordPress in Eric's container. I have a PHP shell because PHP interpreter and the environment's there. Um, it makes it harder. You have to live off the land and have live off a narrow amount of land. Um, you can also mark uh, containers as non-writable. So it's a copy on write model, and the file system shouldn't be written to. So that saves you a bit, too. Um, no shell, no RDP, no NetBIOS, no PowerShell. You can do better, in my opinion. So what does this actually mean, Ben? So this is a very simplified example of, um, I don't know if it worked, Eric, for what you're doing, but it would work for a simple service here. So auto-scaling group number one on the left has six containers that are running. Let's say it's Amazon ECS, Kubernetes, doesn't matter. They're running fine, and that thing up top's a load balancer. So the load balancer takes requests in, makes decisions, in the back end where to send them, sends them to Docker containers. We're all good. And we decide we have to roll new containers. Because these containers you build have a shelf life. 
once you commit these things and they're immutable, like they have a shelf life, Java's going to age quickly. OpenSSH is going to age quickly. Whatever you put in there, hoping you're not putting OpenSSH in, but they're going to age, so you have to roll new ones. In this case, fire up a new auto-scaling group and start putting in new containers that you have and they're ready to go. The green traffic is coming in and we're getting ready to push stuff, new traffic, uh, blue and auto-scaling group too. The backend data store is persistent, so that's the only persistent thing in this model. So we can do this all via code and say, hey, we want to roll to the new stuff. We go ahead and take auto-scaling group one and start knocking over, like cattle, those containers, because there's no data in those things. We don't need them. Load balancer is aware of it. It's shifting traffic over to auto-scaling group two, and we start to put the load over there until we knock over and destroy all the containers over on left. The only thing that persists here is the database at the back end. So that's a rolling deploy, which can be done stateless during production, it can be done quickly, it's repeatable, and you have immutability in the containers. Can we do better? I think you can do even better than that. So yes, what do you deliver? Increased uptime, increased flux, you can do this thing all the time. Um, you can scan your Docker registry. So that root of trust, where does this Docker come from? You have a registry somewhere. You can scan that registry to make sure your containers are good. Um, there's a tool called Clear that does it, other tools you can get, but if you run Nessus against your environment, Nessus is pretty much not Docker aware, at least not that I'm aware of, but running against your Docker registry with something like Clear will tell you if you're missing certain, certain, certain patches, updates, et cetera. Um, talk about reduced attack surface, and you can validate your container integrity. You can do a diff, or you can mark them as read-only, so your ability to change the container because it's immutable is, is removed. Can we do better? I think you can do even more than this. Um, it's not just containers. You can drive your infrastructure this way. So your security groups, your DNS entries. Like, how often do you change your DKIM or SPF settings? Probably, re I, hope, I hope rarely. So maybe that should be under code control. You should push that out with dual control and have code manage those settings, not have a human manage them. Your routes, your databases, your IP addresses, your firewalls. Um, ASDM is a pain in the butt to use for... ASA management, but you can get from your ASDM the changes are delta, and you can apply those via code if you want, and not be inside the GUI using your pink sombrero. Changes, aren't, changes which are not under dual approval and don't have tests are rogue. So if we do these things via code, we need APIs. Um, if you have APIs, they have pretty strong authentication, usually a key and a secret at a minimum, but you can do better. Um, you can apply certificate-based authentication to APIs. So you need a certificate, not an IP whitelist, plus your credentials to have an API do something. That's pretty powerful. So vendors can provide this stuff, APIs, strong authentication, and options for containerization. So if you're talking to your vendors, I would ask them, do you have an API? That's important to me. And then I would ask them, do you support containers? And if they don't, that may be the case, but it's a good question to ask. Um, you can do really advanced Docker monitoring. Uh, there's a tool called Falco from Sysdig. There's a commercial one called Twistlock. They will monitor the containers and look for processes in the containers. Look at the network traffic and monitor what's not necessarily a blind spot, but monitor an environment that's immutable to make sure it's immutable. And if you didn't listen to any of this, uh, which is okay, but at least use Docker at home. Try this stuff at home. It's a good way to do a home lab. Uh, Brandon at SecDSM, uh, gave a talk about something called Hugin, which is an agent or like monitoring thing for social media, adversaries, etc. It is a pain to set up. I spent about an hour and I got really frustrated and there's a Docker container. I fired it up and was testing it in minutes. So it helps for testing. So I went through this pretty quick. I wanted to make, save a little time, but I'm pretty much down to the end. I think immutability is very powerful. It's a new-ish technique we should consider as a security defense. Ordinary things can become sensors or honeypots. If you're SSHing in, and you have pink sombrero on, multi-factor that, and that should be rogue, but you can document why you needed to do it. Otherwise, if anyone else is SSHing in, it's a pen test. Um, integrity is king. More and more cryptographic signing to assure integrity is gonna become popular in operating systems. Uh, and ruthless automation takes discipline. It's easy to just go ahead in a small environment and install the stuff, but take the discipline to automate that, get it under source code control, dual approval, and get it under multi-factor. Um, and watch your snowflakes really closely. So I put the references up. Um, I want to make sure you had those. 
That's the cowboy coating and pink sombrero link. The original post is down. I had to find a repost of it because um, it's eight years old almost. But I will stop for any questions because I went through that really fast. How do they do log monitoring? Log monitoring. Yeah. It depends on your environment. That's the, the, the simple answer. But if you're in AWS, they have APIs that allow you to have the logs, or you can do instrumentation to do more. So I think there's two parts of logs that are important. So you have all your authentication events that should be centralized. And Duo is a good way to do that. Because if you don't multi-factor and pass Duo, you don't pass muster. So that's one place I would have logs. The second is all those orchestration events that happen. Let's say it's through ECS. You have things that have a cloud formation and orchestration tool. I would multi-factor that. You're going to use some kind of CI tool to do that. Circle CI, Jenkins, whatever else. Those logs are really valuable. And then you have things that are running out in your containers. You may want to instrument those. So there's Sysdig, uh, Falco, other ones, and you have those logs. Where would I put them all? Splunk or an Elk stack that you have running in your environment. But that's a really environment-specific question. It's hard to say. But the ones that are really important are your authentication events. Um, because you multi-factor them, that becomes an easy way to detect rogue activity. So that's probably half the answer you want, but it's, that's more like, let's go grab a coffee and talk at a whiteboard, and we'll figure that out. Okay, thanks for coming, stay dry. <laughs>